So uh, now um, to continue with our program, I am very pleased to introduce to you Dr. Richard Horwitz. Dr. Horwitz is a board certified internist and medical director of the Hudson Valley Healing Arts Center in New York State. He found himself on the front lines of the Lyme disease epidemic in downstate New York in the 1980s and has treated over 13,000 patients with the chronic persistent symptoms of Lyme disease in his over 30 years of practice. He is the author of two best-selling books on Lyme disease and numerous scientific articles which are leading to a better clinical de definition for the chronic Lyme disease MCID subgroup of Lyme disease patients. Thank you, Holly, and uh, thank you for inviting me here today. It's always a pleasure to come to Arizona. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through um, monkeys and labs and cultures with biofilms, and I'm going to show you what we have done um, in clinic treating several hundred patients with some new protocols that we've been developing over the past um, several years. Um, one thing I should mention, by the way, which is on here, um, you can see on the disclaimer down there, be very clear the views expressed you're going to hear today from me definitely do not represent the Tick-Borne Disease Working Group, HHS, or the United States. Um, these are my own viewpoints, although what you're about to see, the study I'm about to show you, was just published three weeks ago uh, in the medical literature, so I've got some brand new research to show you, and I think what you'll find interesting is it kind of brings together what you've heard today from Garth about biofilms and uh, Monica about persisters, uh, and also the immune response. We found exactly the same thing in humans. So I'm going to show you this uh, in, in human models. So this is the paper that just got published just three weeks ago. <clears throat> it's a two-part paper. Uh, the first part, Precision Medicine, Retrospective Chart Review and Data Analysis of 200 Patients on Dapsone Combination Therapy for Chronic Lyme Disease, PTLDS, Part 1. So in this paper of precision medicine, we call it precision medicine because, as I'll show you, there were no two patients, in fact, who've ever seen me over the years who have exactly the same abnormalities. Some have co-infections with Babesia, some do not. Some have Bartonella. Uh, some have severe sleep disorders, some do not. So we have to approach these patients from an individualized perspective. And um, I'm sorry I didn't take pictures of this, but this was a retrospective study of 657 volumes of medical charts. Um, I should have taken pictures in the room. Um, literally, the charts were above my head in stacks. And at super speed, I was going through the charts, pulling out the data for a whole team of people that then put it into Excel files. Um, and then we had several statisticians actually analyze the data. Part two was published just a few months ago in the journal Healthcare. Uh, this was part two, the role of the MSIDS model in defining, diagnosing, and treating chronic Lyme disease, PTLDS. So in part one, we just looked at infections and some of the immune response. In part two, which I'll be discussing in detail tomorrow, we looked at the other 15 points on the MSIDS model uh, that were keeping people ill, but I'll tell you a little bit about it today. So the first question is, is why, did, why do all of the patients get sick? Now, you're going to hear a little bit later uh, from Holly about the diagnostics. We know that the tests lack adequate sensitivity. We know that the two-tiered testing doesn't work. Um, in fact, many of us were very happy to see the article by Steve Schutzer that came out just a couple of months ago uh, talking about how inadequate the serology was. We've all known it for years. What I'll show you in the study that we just did is how many people, in fact, were not two-tier positive, um, how many people had IgM versus IgG. You'll, you'll find it actually be quite fascinating. Um, and the reason this is important is that there's 5 million people in the United States that have been diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. And you know, how do you make the diagnosis of those? Well, it's a chronic fatiguing musculoskeletal illness with cognitive issues and a lot of times also dysautonomy and sleep disorders. Well, those are exactly the same symptoms you're seeing with Lyme. Um, we know about persistence. Now, the interesting part about why I looked at Dapsone is all of us who've been in the field, I've been doing this for over three decades, we knew that Borrelia persists because every time you would stop the antibiotics in people, they would start to relapse. But I never thought of Borrelia as a persister bacteria like tuberculosis or leprosy. So when Dr. Ying Zhang from Hopkins had published this a couple of years ago, when I was at Mount Sinai doing my internal medicine residency, I had treated HIV patients with tuberculosis. I was very used to using mycobacterium drugs with pyrazinamide and rifampin. I needed an excuse to use them in Lyme patients. And once Ying Zhang had published his study, what I did is I started looking at these compounds, seeing how they would be effective. Um, 
What you need to know, and this is very important from my talk, is that the persisters, everyone today has been talking about Lyme. I'm going to show you evidence of persistence of not just Lyme disease, but also Babesiosis, Bartonella, Mycoplasma species, Tularemia, Brucella, and herpes viruses, including herpes virus 6, which we found reactivated by fourfold increases in titers and PCR positives, DNA in the blood of some of these sickest patients. Um, and then finally, of course, I think you know about the healthcare politics that I think with the tick-borne disease working group are finally starting to make making some headway. So this was a two-year study. It was a patient symptom survey and retrospective chart review of 200 patients with chronic Lyme PDLDS, and we had three aims to the study. The first aim was to better define chronic Lyme disease. The second was evaluate the efficacy of Dapsone combination therapy. And again, how I came upon Dapsone is that when Ying Zhang talked about it and I looked at the mycobacterium drugs, um, he had screened with an FDA approved library, but no one ever talked about pyrazinamide or Dapsone. When I looked at the mechanism of Dapsone, what was fascinating is it hits persister bacteria like leprosy. It's anti-inflammatory, and as you heard earlier, most of the symptoms that patients with Lyme disease get are due to inflammation. So these are usually inflammatory cytokines like tumor necrosis factor alpha, IL-1, IL-6, interferon gamma. Um, so we, see, we wanted to see what Dapsone would do for these people with inflammation. But Dapsone also is used for malarial organisms, and the majority of my patients had babesiosis. And we know that they fail mepron, they fail malarone, they fail a lot of the traditional uh, uh, type of compounds that we're trying to use for this disease. We wanted to see what Dapsone would do. And then we also wanted to look in detail, and I talked about this in my books, but I never published it in the peer review literature. And I can tell you that the 200 patients I'll show you is pretty much representative of what I've seen in the thousands of patients over the years. In other words, what do these patients come in with apart from Lyme disease that is keeping them ill? So this is from part one, um, the percentage of patients with MSIDS abnormality. So this is, I describe this sometimes like someone goes into a doctor's office with 16 nails in the foot, telling the doctor they have foot pain and the doctor just removes one of the nails. You really have to look at all the nails. And one way of understanding the MSIDS map, uh, MSIDS stands for Multiple Systemic Infectious Disease Syndrome, is that on the left-hand side, you see the primary sources, which is chronic infections. And the main ones I'll tell you about today will be Borrelia, Bartonella, Mycoplasma, Tularemia, Brucella, um, and viruses, as well as Babesia. You can, however, get dysbiosis of the intestinal bacteria. Now, if you look at the medical literature during the last several years, there's a lot of literature now coming out on Prevotella species, um, Bifidobacterium, a lot of different species that are now showing up um, with Firmicutes ratio showing an a relationship with rheumatoid arthritis, with multiple sclerosis, with Alzheimer's disease. We now know that the microbiome of your gut is definitely influencing a lot of these disease processes and cytokine formation. So when you look at CDSAs, um, which is a way of measuring the microbiome, you can actually see differences in some of these patients. We then looked at leaky gut with food allergies. What's interesting about that is that a large percentage of my patients have either mast cell activation or they've got food allergies with leaky gut. And guess what? That causes exactly the same cytokines that you see with Lyme. So when you hear people say your diet is extremely important, the answer is yes. The bugs love to feed off sugar. Um, certain people feel better without gluten. But you should know that if you're eating allergic foods, it's very difficult in a clinical trial. When you're doing an NIH trial just looking at Lyme and you're not looking at all these other sources of where inflammation may be coming from, it's very difficult to be able to really tease it out. Just from the point of view of sleep disorders, when you don't fall asleep, you increase one of these inflammatory cytokines called interleukin-6. And as you'll see from the study we published, uh, over 90% of our patients don't sleep. Angela was telling you her story. It's very classic. Either I can't fall asleep, I keep waking up in the middle of the night, or they have hypersomnolence where they may sleep for 16 hours at a time. But we also looked at environmental toxins. We looked at heavy metals like mercury and lead, um, and cadmium, aluminum, arsenic. We found actually over 70% of these patients were high in lead and mercury, and the reason this is important, mercury acts as what's called a haptin on, south, on the outside of cells causing autoimmune responses. There have been prior studies shown that when you remove the heavy metals and you have an infection, a lot of times the pain in the inflammatory cytokine goes down. 
We also found in our patient population in 70% who had mold exposure, we found up to all four mycotoxins, aflatoxins, trichothicines, um, and gliotoxins, which are immunosuppressive. So you don't want immunosuppressive toxins in your body on top of Lyme causing immune suppression. I'll show you Monica's work this morning, Animals exactly mimics what she was describing in Nicole Baumgott's work. You'll see it's exactly the same thing we found in our patients. And if you have nutritional deficiencies in magnesium, that's necessary for 300 detoxification enzymes. If you're missing copper, Garth was just talking to you about superoxide dismutase helping to deal with this free radical oxidative stress. Um, we found copper deficiency in a lot of our patients. And same thing with zinc. If you're low in zinc, you're gonna form inflammatory cytokines. So on the left-hand side, this is what we're finding, multiple sources of inflammation in our patients going way beyond Lyme disease. But what no one's really talking about is the downstream effects of what this oxidative stress is doing to the body. We found endocrine disorders, men with low testosterone. These inflammatory cytokines affect your hypothalamic pituitary axis. So about 70% or more had low adrenal function. Uh, some women, they stopped having their menstrual cycles. We see a lot of neurological, psychological dysfunction. About 40% of the patients had a form of neuropathy uh, called POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. What this means is, is that it's a form of neuropathy. Neuropathy in Lyme patients is, I have tingling, I have numbness, I have burning, I have stabbing sensations of my skin um, and my nerves, but this is an autonomic neuropathy where you can't control your blood pressure. The reason this is important is the symptoms look like Lyme disease where you might think you need antibiotics, but you don't. So POTS is, I'm tired. When I stand up, I get dizzy. I get palpitations. I feel I'm gonna pass out. I get anxiety. I have cognitive difficulties. If you give people Floronef and Midadrine and Northera, drugs that raise the blood pressure, a lot of those underlying symptoms get better. That is not a treatment with an antibiotic. But you've gotta fix the downstream effects of what the inflammation did to people. We then found mitochondrial dysfunction. Mitochondria in the body are the organelles that make your energy. They are not protected. The DNA in your body is protected by histones. They're protected against this free radical oxidative stress. Mitochondria are not. So if you look at the medical literature from Garth Nicholson, one third of the people with Lyme disease responded to mitochondrial support, NT factors, CoQ10, acetyl L-carnitine. Now in our study, we did not find a lot of benefit, but it's mainly because we saw such positive effects of dapsone combination therapy. And then finally, there were pain syndromes, liver dysfunction, and a lot of autoimmunity. So we found a lot of ANAs, rheumatoid factors, antithyroglobulin antibodies, um, antimyelin antibodies, antigangliocyte antibodies. We know that Borrelia causes autoimmune phenomenon, and low-dose naltrexone, by the way, decreases microglial activation in the brain, and it helps to reverse some of those difficulties. So when someone has, says, I can't get diagnosed with Lyme disease, like you just heard earlier from Angela, we published a study about two years ago in the International Journal of Medicine um, on combination, looking at the symptoms of Lyme disease. And what we found is there were six major symptoms that showed up. Neuropathy, which would come and go and migrate around the body. Cognitive dysfunction, where you've ruled people out for B12 deficiency and folic acid deficiency and hypothyroidism and heavy metals and other things that cause cognitive problems. Um, musculoskeletal pain, the hallmark being it migrates. Um, and it's very important in this article, what we discovered when we published it, is Lyme is only one of seven diseases that causes migratory pain. So when someone says to you, the pain is in my shoulder, and two days later it's in my elbow, and four days later it's in my knee, there's only six other diseases in medicine that cause that, and most people who see me do not have gonococcal arthritis, um, and they don't have inflammatory bowel disease with Crohn's disease, and they don't have active hepatitis. They might have lupus, but we screen them for double-stranded DNA and Smith antibodies, and we generally don't find it, although in this patient population, two of them did. The point is, is that if you score above 63 on this questionnaire, you are two standard deviations above the mean, you have a very high probability of being exposed to Lyme disease. And it's very important, and Angela, in your case, I heard you say up here, it was moving around my body, that's exactly what we hear in the vast majority, over 90% of our patients will tell us this. So remember, I'm an internist, 
I take a classical history from a patient. I don't just rely on blood tests, right? But when we looked at the tests, this is exactly what we found. Less than 20% of our patients in our patient population who were chronically ill had erythema migrans rashes. Now, the lowest you've ever seen in the literature is 9%. The highest is usually quoted by the CDC as 70 to 80%. When you look at the IgM Western blots, which was just discussed earlier by Monica, about 45% of our patients were CDC IgM Western blot positive, and only about 10% were IgG. Well, that's kind of interesting because that mimics Brian Fallon's study, his NIH study published in Neurology in 2008. And if you look at the Redmond and Alcott article published in Clinical Rheumatology back in 2014, the number is exactly the same. It's about 45%. That's exactly what Monica was describing this morning. We see many more IgM antibodies because, as you heard from Nicole Baumgart's study, when it affects the germinal centers in the lymph nodes, it gets rid of that part of the lymph node making IgG antibodies, which are way more effective in clearing infections than IgM. So a lot of doctors think when they see an IgM antibody for Lyme, it's a false positive. They think you can't possibly have a chronic positive, CDC positive IgM. Well, this is now the second study. Redmond's was published about five years ago, showing in fact it happens more than most doctors would like to admit. And then we looked at immunofluorescent antibodies, analyzes, and C6 analyzes, which are supposed to be better, because the C6 ELISA doesn't just look at Borrelia burgdorferi, but looks at European strains like Borrelia afzeli, Borrelia garinii. We actually found the C6 was worse than the regular ELISA, and patients came in with lymphocyte transformation tests called Elispots. So you can see from our study, it was pretty much less than 20% of the time these people were coming in with that two-tiered testing where they had a positive ELISA or a positive C6 followed by a Western blot. We then looked at these 200 patients who had multiple Western blots done over time. And we had at least 400 data points. In fact, I think for the Western blots, we had 700 Western blots. We inputted every band on a Western blot that a patient had in the study. Now, normally an IgM Western blot from CDC criteria is considered positive if two out of three bands are positive. Your 23, your outer surface protein C, your 39, highly specific for Lyme, and the 41, which is not specific because you can get denticol asparagines in your mouth that give you a false positive 41. However, the 31 and the 34 band in our study on an IgM, and this is mainly through Igenix laboratories, that doesn't just use the B31 strain of Borrelia, but uses the 297 strain, we find that when we combine strains and we look at those bands, the OSP A and the OSP B, the 3134, showed up to be positive in anywhere between 20, 20 to 40% of the time. Why is that important? Well, if you're a patient who scores high on the HMQ over 63 with migratory pain, and you have any Lyme-specific band on a Western blot, OSP-C, OSP-A, OSP-B, 34. Now, it's true that the OSP-A, that protein can co-migrate with viral infections, okay? Igenex does have another test to look at that, but their immunoblot, which is the latest version of the Western blot, they've now gotten past that problem with the OSP-A, and they've combined multiple strains, including Avzeli and Garini and California strains, so you can actually pick this up and know that it's accurate. We then looked at the bands on the IgG we found the 31 and 34 bands, also not considered to be some of those five out of 10 bands for the CDC, again, showing a positive. So we discussed this at the Tickborne Working Group. I'm, I'm sure Pat Smith is probably smiling when she read this article, because she was the one who was bringing up the necessity that doctors need to know all the bands on the Western blot. They don't want to know whether it's CDC positive or not. We want to know what those bands are, because as a clinician, it tells me whether you may have been exposed to a Borrelia species. Now we took how many patients were CDC positive for IgM, IgG. We broke them down by bands, but you'll see um, in the bottom here that 3.2% of these people who were IgG Western blot positive, right, had high negative ELISAs and high negative C6. When we looked at it for the IgMs, you'll notice that it was 22% of these people had a high positive IgM, CDC positive, 
but were negative for the ELISA anywhere between 25 to almost 40% of the time. Again, you cannot rely on the two-tiered testing. The 31 and 34 bands, or in fact, any Borrelia-specific bands, at least tells you you've been exposed to a Borrelia species, having ruled out, again, viral migration of proteins. And then what we did in the study is we expanded the Babesia testing. What we had in our study is that if you just look for Babesia microti, which is the main one we're supposed to have on the East Coast, and you didn't look for Babesia duncani, WA1, you would have missed a large number of these Babesia patients. And if you didn't do PCR or fish testing, RNA, and Garth was just telling you about the sensitivity of RNA, RNA testing really tells you that you've got active infections. You can see these bugs fluoresce green under the microscope using fish fluorescent in situ hybridization. So when we expanded our Babesia testing, and we looked at not just Lyme, but Rickettsia, relapse, uh, Q fever, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, Bartonella, Mycoplasma, Tularemia, Brucella, what's very important in these is that some of these infections can be very fatal in the young or elderly. And what we found is between 64% had five to eight co-infections, meaning two-thirds of the patients in this study had between five and eight co-infections. Now, now all of these are tick-borne, but this is what we found. 13.5% had anaplasma. Why is anaplasma important? It's immunosuppressive. If you don't treat with doxycycline early in the course, anaplasma can actually change your immune response in chronic Lyme disease. Bartonella, both by Bartonella hensile and Bartonella quintana, was almost 47% of our patients in this study. Um, I had to convince our group at the Tick-Borne Works Group, because I was co-chair of the other tick-borne infections and co-infections, I had to convince them to include Bartonella as part of the ones we were going to discuss in the first congressional report. And in fact, it turned out, as you can see from the study, it's almost 50% of our patients who are chronically ill. Brucella was about 10%. Chlamydia pneumonia, 51%. Ehrlichia was pretty much almost the same as anaplasma, 14%. And then we found multiple mycoplasma species, but some of these were PCR positive, like penetrans and fermentans after long-term antibiotics. I'll show you this in a second. Q fever is a persister bacteria, Coxiella burnetti. Um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever was found in 10%. Now, it is known that you can get false positives for Rocky Mountain spotted fever in about 10% of the US population. It's exactly the figure that's been published in the medical literature. Um, and then we found parasites like Babesia by titer in 52%, but as I'll show you in a second, it was over 80% of our patients in the study that had uh, the parasite Babesia microti or Babesia duncani. And finally, we had viruses, herpes virus one and two, but HHV6 was high, as you'd expect it to be. It's slap cheap disease that most people get when you're young. But we did find viral reactivation. Now, West Nile was 6.5%. It is a flavor virus. Why is West Nile important? Because with West Nile, as I'll show you in a second when we discuss Powassan, it can be a chronic, persistent flavor virus in the body. And what makes this difficult from Connie Knox's study that was just published in 2017 and 18, now in the United States in highly endemic Lyme areas, between 10 to 16% of people living in Lyme endemic areas are now showing positive for Powassan uh, antibodies. Now, just like West Nile, it might only be one out of 150 who come down with a severe encephalitis. But if these flavor viruses, if West Nile and Powassan happen to be persistent, you're dealing with persistent neurological viruses in your central nervous system on top of Lyme and on top of parasites. So again, when you look at the co-infections, you can see here that we're seeing a lot of Babesia, a lot of Bartonella. Um, you know, Epstein-Barr virus, you would expect a lot of people have been exposed to it. We only found one or two that were PCR positive in our study. Um, a lot of HHV6 and mycoplasma. But tularemia was 16%. Now, most doctors don't look for tularemia. There was an article that just got published a few months ago that we're seeing increasing rates of tularemia, which is rabbit fever. I don't think all of our patients had active tularemia. What I think was happening is a lot of these patients, it was actually Bartonella um, because they never had fourfold increases in titers, but some of them did, as I'll show you one of our patients with an autoimmune illness.
So this is the study that was just published by Connie Knox just recently on serological evidence of Powassan. Um, we did not check for Powassan in our study because we only could do it through New York State Department of Health. Now Cope Labs is starting to do it with some other laboratory, so it'll be easier to get uh, some of these serologies done. So here's the study on Babesia. We found almost equal amounts of Babesia microti and Babesia duncani. Um, several patients had both. And as you can see from the Babesia fish, this RNA study, it showed up in 34% of our patients, um, and many of these were seronegative. So again, the take home message is when you're screening for someone that says, I have malaria-like symptoms, day sweats, night sweats, chills, flushing, air hunger, I can't catch my breath, a cough I can't explain, those are classic Babesia symptoms. And not all of these people, by the way, are GMSA positive. You can't find it under the microscope when you're looking at a GMSA stain. A lot of the load of the parasites is very low, and that's why we need PCR and fish testing in a lot of these patients. So you can see from this particular study that among the seronegative patients, it was 37.5% that were positive by either direct testing, PCR, or fish, mostly fish. And that's why we use a very broad screening when we're looking for Babesia. We then asked the question, has Babesia duncani while one spread to the Northeast? According to the medical literature, this particular strain of Babesia is only supposed to be on the West Coast, while one means like Washington one. Well, if you look at the number of patients um, who ended up having Babesia duncani, you'll notice a lot of them were actually on the East Coast, and we mapped it out. And you'll notice that a lot of them were in Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, Texas, on the East Coast going up to Maine. Now, what was fascinating about the Maine patients, which was about 6 or 7% of the patients in the study, is there was an article published in Healthcare just several months before that they found off the Nova Scotia coast Babesia duncani. They were showing up, and that's about 200 miles, by the way, from the northern part of Maine. So it actually fits that it's spread, but the problem is there's only been 13 positive Babesia duncani by the CDC that are known definitely to be Babesia duncani. I spoke to Sam Telford about this in general, who is on our subcommittee. Um, we need to get some of these serologies over to them to prove it. And then we looked at persistence, just that you heard from Monica this morning about what she found in the macaque monkeys. What we found in our patients is 14.5% of our patients were PCR positive despite months or years of antibiotics prior to doing dapsone combination therapy. We found Babesia species positive by PCR or fish. They had been on Mepron and Zithromax. They had been on clindamycin and quinine, classic drugs for treating Babesiosis. And I actually had done a study on this 20 years ago that I showed at the International Lyme Conference where we found this to be positive. Bartonella, we found PCR and fish. I had about 16 or 17 patients that were RNA positive for Bartonella who had been on antibiotics, and I'm not talking single. I'm talking double, triple, quadruple intracellular therapy. The Bartonella were still alive. Take home message for all of you researchers, don't just focus on Lyme. We need new Babesia drugs, and we need combinations for Bartonella. They are turning out to be some of the co-infections that are interfering in my patients getting well, because as I'm about to show you from Dapsone studies, um, the Dapsone combination therapy is turning out to be extremely effective because I'm using the same type of therapy they use to treat tuberculosis and leprosy. Then we looked at tularemia. Some of these patients had fourfold reactivations. Um, one of the patients with Brucella was agglutination positive. We had several mycoplasma species through MDL laboratory positive after years of antibiotics, fermentans and penetrans. And again, the viruses HHV6 reactivated. Now, the reason the HHV6 is important is there was a researcher at Mount Sinai who recently published in Neurology at the end of 2018, Joel Dudley. I spoke with Joel at a Mount Sinai conference at the end of last year. They published that they're finding HHV6 and HHV7 in Alzheimer's patients. They don't know whether it is causative, associative. We know that Lyme disease, if you read Judith McClossey's studies on Alzheimer's or Alan McDonald, you'll see they're finding spirochetes in the brains of Alzheimer's patients, as well as herpes virus 1 and herpes virus 2 and chlamydia pneumonia and helicobacter pylori, which is a spirochetal organism in the stomach. They're finding a lot of bugs under biofilms. 
and they're suspecting that it may be the tau proteins and the amyloid that is actually being produced trying to attack the organism, and the biofilm is basically protecting it. So it may be that what we're looking at is viruses and bacteria and pesticides, which we found in about 1.5% of our patients in the study with Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's is known to be caused by pesticides. We looked for it in our Parkinsonian patients, and we found a small percentage. In Alzheimer's patients, they found when you put neurological brain cells in culture with pesticides, they form amyloid and tau proteins. In medicine, we are using a one disease, one cause, one disease model. I would put forth to you that if we want to move chronic disease medicine ahead in the 21st century, you have to go from one cause, one disease to a multifactorial model. It doesn't work in clinical practice just to look at Lyme. You've got to look at all of these factors, and you're probably going to find the same thing with Alzheimer's because they found sleep deprivation associated with dementia. Um, a lot of these I've looked at in the future. So we, we have a lot of reasons why these people are sick. We know from the medical literature these treatment failures are due to persistence of Lyme in the fibroblasts of the skin, in the eyes, in the ligaments, in the joints, in the endothelial cells and macrophages. And I think in our patients, that's probably one of the main places they're hiding because the dapsone combination therapy of doxycycline, rifampin, and dapsone are all intracellular drugs. And we used multiple biofilm busters in our study, which I'm about to show you to get these people better. It's been in the central nervous system, Coyle and Liegner, um, and finally, of course, in biofilms, as you heard from Garth. So in the mice, Hotzik had published on this years ago that he was finding um, Borrelia could persist. Uh, Monik has done several studies on rhesus uh, macaque monkeys, and of course, that study she did was, was really excellent, including the histological one that you didn't show this morning, but I mean, it was also a great one on the histopathology. Um, and then when you look at the PTLDS study from the NIH, from Adriana Marquez, interestingly enough, they found that one of those patients was PCR positive, but they never explained in the article why somebody who had PTLDS and treated with antibiotics still had DNA um, in the Xenodiagnostics, diagnostics where they put uninfected ticks on people who had already been treated. So when we data mined this, of course, we found a high percentage of infections. Again, I'm stressing Babesia bartonella with certain mycoplasma species, Trulium brucella intracellular. We found a lot of immune dysfunction, over 70%, positive anti-nuclear antibodies, positive rheumatoid factors, you're much worse if you're HLA DR2 or 4 positive. Alan Steer has published on this extensively that it makes those autoimmune phenomenon and inflammatory cytokines much worse. But here's what Monica was talking about earlier that I believe were the first people who had ever put this in the medical literature um, in the Lyme population. What we found is, is that 20% of our patients had IgG deficiency. We found that almost 20% had IgM deficiency almost 16% IgA deficiency, and 85.5% had combined subclass deficiencies, one through four. So let's take a look at what that is. So the reason this is important, if you make more, many more IgM antibodies, as you heard earlier, right, 45% of our patients were IgM CDC positive, right, that's been shown in the study that Monica showed you. So we found very high amounts, right, 20% with high IgMs, but we also found, right, in this case, low, I'm sorry, this is the low group, 20%, and again, 20% IgG, but we also found high IgMs, right, and several high IgG, but the subclass deficiencies that were the biggest were subclass one and subclass three. Why is it important that these people had low subclass one and three? When you go through the medical literature, there was only one study published years ago in early Lyme. You heard from Monica this morning from the Blum study. You need a robust B cell response to make antibodies to clear the infection. What they found in these studies is they made subclasses one and three early in the infection. What did we find in chronic Lyme? Low subclass one and three with low IgG. And it was about 14% of our patients had chronic variable immune deficiency if they did not get immunoglobulin therapy, either IV or subcutaneous, they would not respond to the antibiotics appropriately. So we basically confirmed what has been now shown in the animal model that exactly the same thing is happening in humans. There is immune deficiency showing up from Borrelia infections, and then you've got all these co-infections complicating it at the same time. So the common denominator we're seeing here, 
is tularemia and brucella and anaplasma and ehrlichia and Q fever. These are all intracellular infections causing inflammation and immune dysfunction. And intracellular infections may be resistant to therapy and located in biofilms. So this is one of the biofilms that Eva Shapi had worked on in her lab at the University of New Haven. And as I said, what I decided to do was to look at other persister bacteria like mycobacterium but then also take the research that was coming out of Eva Shapi and Ying Zhang's lab at Hopkins and say, well, what happens if I use these essential oils, right? If I use stevia and I use biocidin and I use lauricidin, monolaurin, um, and I start using oregano oil, what happens to my Lyme patients when I give them dapsone combination therapy? Because persisters are a small fraction of these quiescent bacterial cells that survive lethal antibiotics and regrow. And just to tell you the good news on this, my wife, who has had Lyme disease for probably 40 years, the first 21 years of our marriage, every time she came off antibiotics or herbs, she relapsed. She's now almost two years in complete remission with not one symptom since she did dapsone combination therapy. And there are several people in the audience, I can't mention who they are, who have done this therapy today. You can speak to them if they'd like to talk to you about it. But we're having tremendous success. But where I'm having the problem is the people who are failing dapsone combination therapy have active babesiosis and active Bartonella. And that is where I believe the research needs to go as the next step. Everyone's been looking at Lyme. Please, we need to start looking at the co-infections. They're playing a huge role in my patient population. So we published a study uh, back in 2016. Are mycobacterium drugs, the drugs used for tuberculosis and leprosy, are they effective treatment for Lyme disease, tick-borne co-infections, and autoimmune disease? And this was a woman with a very rare autoimmune disorder called Bisset syndrome. Now, Bisset syndrome is an unknown autoimmune illness. You look at the literature, they call it Silk Road disease. These people who lived in the Middle East would get this disease and nobody knew why. You can see, if you look carefully on this, she had these big ulcers on her tongue in genital regions, big granulomas at the distal part of her hands, tremendous inflammation. She failed 20 years of what are called DMARD regimens, methotrexate, prednisone, Arava, Enbrel, these drugs that suppress your immunity. She failed them for 20 years. What did she go on? A tuberculosis drug, pyrazinamide. She went on doxycycline, rifampin, and pyrazinamide, and within two months, for the first time in 20 years, her ulcers cleared up, and the granulomas on her hands went away. Now, why is this interesting? When she was on the dapsone combination therapy with doxy, rifampin, and dapsone, her tularemia turned positive, her Bartonella titers were negative and turned positive, and her VGF, her vascular endothelial growth factor, turned positive with a relapse of herpes virus 6. We then went in and treated it with these mycobacterium drugs and her autoimmune illness got better. My best shot at what is besets, it's Bartonella. It's Bartonella combined with parasites because if you look at the Bartonella species, Bartonella quintana, which is in that area, causes exactly these type of lesions with parasitic infections. You can look at the article, it's actually quite fascinating. So the biofilm, I believe, as Garth was telling you earlier, it's the reason we've been having problems. So in the study that I'm now about to show you, we used oregano. We used stevia. And I combined them because I wasn't sure which of these biofilm busters might have been the best. The first study we did on Dapsone was published about two years ago on 100 patients where we showed statistical significance for eight major Lyme symptoms. The only symptom that did not get better was headaches. In this study, we found statistical significance in every Lyme symptom, fatigue, pain, headaches, neuropathy, sleep problems, forgetfulness and brain fog, cognitive issues, and it did help the Babesia with day sweats, night sweats, flushing, or chills. So this just shows you that all of the symptoms, right, went down on dopsone combination therapy. We then looked at culture. We looked at the biofilms. And we looked at how do these antibiotic combinations affect the biofilms. Garth was talking about this. And you'll see, and we have a study that will be published this year. I'm working on it. I just started writing it up with Eva. We started looking at what happens with these drugs we're using. Now, what's interesting is rifampin, which is used for tuberculosis and leprosy, I don't know that people knew that it was a biofilm buster. It actually lowered the biofilm load by about 30%. When we looked at doxy alone, not so great. Dapsone alone, not great. 
Cefuroxime for the cell wall forms, not great. The best combination was doxycycline, rifampin, and dapsone. Within 72 hours, it lowered 50% of the biofilm mass. 50% within 72 hours. Now again, I'm using this. This was not used with stevia, oregano oil, loricidin, biocidin, which are biofilm busters I used in clinical practice. So I believe to shift the paradigm, what we're looking at, we're looking at multiple infections, environmental toxins helping to drive the autoimmune response. You might have inflammation with epinetic changes. We're finding immune deficiency in these patients, as you heard about earlier. And off this inflammation and the downstream effects is affecting your hormones, mitochondrial damage, autonomic neuropathy, increasing symptoms. So the solution is basically to lower the inflammation by treating not just Lyme, but Babesia, Bartonella. You can block certain biochemical pathways called NF-kappa B that turn on the inflammatory response. You do that with things like glutathione and alpha lipoic acid and antioxidants. Um, you've got to shut down the nitric oxide pathway, which causes peroxynitrite, which is prooxidant. You want to open up the detox pathways, especially NERF2. We do this through broccoli seed extracts and certain other forms of natural therapies with glutathione. We repair the damage using the four R's. Replace the hormones. Repair the mitochondria. Rebalance the autonomic nervous system. And finally, we inoculate the GI tract. We didn't have one patient with Clostridium difficile diarrhea. These patients run antibiotics long term because we use three different probiotics, including Saccharomyces boulardii, which has been published to decrease the incidence of C. diff. So the prior present state of medicine, sorry, I can't heal you. You have a pre-existing condition. The future of medicine, we need to shift to a multifactorial, personalized precision medical model. And I'd like to thank Bay Area Lyme and the MSIDS Research Foundation, who had given very generous grants for us to do the study, and, and for all of my staff at the Hudson Valley Healing Arts Center, who participated in helping us for the data mining. Thank you so much.